Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Human Challenge, where we explore all the human challenges in today's world, the challenges of being human, and how we can challenge ourselves to be more human for the greater good. I'm your host, Vanessa Ferlano, and today we are speaking to reggae singer Jamila, who comes from Kingston, Jamaica, now calling Atlantic Canada home. Jamila is also a Juno-nominated singer for her reggae recording of the year Roots Girl. Welcome to the show, Jamila. I'm so happy that you're here. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations for this Juno nomination. I mean, I think it's fantastic. Um, and and I know you were telling me that this is super special for you because this was a first, I think it's your first track, right? It is my first album ever. Um, our team worked on it through the pandemic. It was certainly a labor of love. So it's really, really good to feel, you know, like it's being acknowledged in this beautiful way. It's I think I think that's beautiful, and I love I love I know you were telling me the story earlier of how your team uh, like because I think your team really encouraged you to do it to go through with the nomination. Oh yeah, so I work with the producer Ben Krillman, and over the past couple of months, he's like, "Well, you know, we put Roots Girl out there, and you know, people seem to like it. Let's see, you know, what we can do with it." And so he encouraged me to um, to apply for this one. I was more confident in the local ones, you know, being your first album, you don't want to hang your hat too high or anything. Anyway, um, we threw our hat in the ring, and here we are, and everyone is so excited. I'm really proud to be able to represent not only my team, but East Coast, Canada, you know, with reggae of all the genres. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I love that. And I, I totally agree. I think uh, the East Coast of Canada is just like this gem. There's so many hidden gems. Um, I, I speak to tons of artists and creatives from out there. And I'm just like, man, like, like the East Coast needs that recognition. So I'm super, super happy for you and, and, and really great that you'll hopefully bring that representation to the region. I think that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to ask you, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey from Kingston, Jamaica to Atlantic Canada? How, how did that happen? That's a, a great question. So I, <laughs> my mom has been living here. She came here as a nurse. And, you know, I love, I love the arc of your podcast and, and the way that it really creates, like, relatability with people and their experiences. A lot of immigrants to Canada come here through healthcare. You know, they come here um, to support the, the health industry as nurses, um, to work in the hospitals, to work in... Um, support care home to make up for a better life and she came here it's going on 13 years now i think and she came to nova scotia canada not having known anyone here wow she went back to school after um her she was working in insurance in jamaica and the, the company came after the 2008 recession and so she went back to school to retrain as a nurse and it was wow. very, it was really tough for our family, but she came, she left my little sister with me. And so she came by herself and I became mother and big sister of my little sister who was just starting high school. I was working in HR um, at a telecommunications company. And after a couple of years, my sister came up to join her once she started growing some roots here and, and felt more comfortable to be able to care for my sister. And then I started um, touring as a supporting vocalist. So I, um, I was touring with reggae bands from all over well the world but it started off with bands in Jamaica I was touring with the Whalers I was touring with Black Uhuru a beautiful singer Shireen Anderson took me on the road as well um, and then I came I was like it's time for me to go see my mom and sister I want to say maybe two years would have passed since I last saw them and I wow. came here and I met a guy I met a guy on Gottingen Street here in Halifax Nova Scotia who played guitars and he went on to become my husband. What? Yeah. And that is the story of how I got here. Um, I had the only knowledge I knew of, I had, pardon me, the only knowledge I had of Nova Scotia was the Bank of Nova Scotia, which historically is the biggest commercial bank in the Caribbean. And it was opened up 25 years after it was opened up here in Nova Scotia. But I didn't even know that place like I didn't have any concept of the place and to, to live here now is pretty wild that's amazing that is amazing and I, I love that story thank you so much for sharing that um that I can't even imagine uh 
that, that that's huge for your family, right? Like your mom, your mom takes this whole new chance, this whole new opportunity. And then you were with your sister. Um, I mean, that's, that's incredible. I, I absolutely love that story. So thank you so much for sharing that. Tell us a little bit about the, you know, the, your, the Jamaican music and, and, and culture and how it, it really impacts and influences your music. That's a great question as well. So I grew up in the roots of the reggae community. Um, on my mom's side, they're really Christian and very conservative. And on my dad's side, they're spiritual, but in a different way. My dad is a Rastafarian man who plays guitars. And his his contribution to reggae his music runs deep. Um, he played with Bob Marley um, and the Whalers as one of their guitarists over the life of their career. And wow. he would have played with on hundreds and hundreds of reggae albums. And I'm talking about from Lauren Hill, Miss Education of Lauren Hill, to all the Marley kids, Joss Stone, Erica Badu, um, just like he represents reggae guitar in a way that um, a lot of musicians still to this day look up to. And so when my when I moved from the countryside of Jamaica, where I was really brought up in the church with my maternal influences, to the Kingston, with a city where, you know, all the opportunities are, these were the influences around me. And I can vividly remember being like, you know, like of high school age and just sitting around my dad and his friends in the studio and just trying to make sense of it all. It was like a magical and wonderful world, but it was also steeped in um, Rastafarian spirituality. And to be able to see the reverence that they brought to the music because of their faith. Wow, that's very powerful. Um, I appreciate the way that you're like recollecting that, you know what I mean? And then sharing it here, because I think that's, that's, that's a very, very, very powerful way of being able to, to put these different pieces of your life together and, and then uh, embody it through creativity. Right. And I think that's, that's really beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask you, I mean, so you're, you have very different uh, styles and very different different influences between your parents. Was there one that like resonated more with you, or how did they how did they maybe influence you? Just even like throughout your life, not necessarily in music, but you know, how do you see? I'm kind of similar. For example, I'm I'm half Mexican, half Italian, and so there are like similarities in some ways, but also very strong differences. And I see how they they these influences how they kind of impact me different journeys throughout my life. You know what I mean? As I kind of evolve and grow, I find there are different parts of the, these cultures that I kind of use at different moments. And so I'm curious what that experience is for you. Oh, that's a great question. There was some conflict there. Christian, mm -hmm. layer of, um, you know, you know, when you're, there's the Christians, but I just find the Seventh-day Adventist faith to be really even more strict than mm -hmm. regular Christian denomination. Um, and then there's the Rastafarian faith, which from the outside looking in looks a little bit, um, they look like ragamuffins for want of a better word. You don't understand what they stand for and the peace and love that they stand for until you are deeply within their community to understand the way that they operate the mindset and the philosophies and, and the things that they hold there um so it's easy to judge them and it's easy to think that they conflict especially when there's things like marijuana that comes into the in play right growing up in the church i was kind of indoctrinated to look at that as being super secular and to be contrarian and I was kind of almost, I'm going to use the word brainwashed to think that <laughs> the author was wrong. And then on the Rastafarian side, the same thing, you know, they're like, oh, the Christian and, you know, you're, you know, the white man brings their, their, you know, their religion and they give it to the black people. And so it's the otherness of it all. So everyone's thinking that the other is the, is wrong. And so because I resonated so much and learned so much and grew so much because of the two sides, it took me a while to be able to find to find myself within the whole mix of things. And this brings me to a really powerful point where, you know, we have these experiences in life, Vanessa, and we learn and we see and we're so quick to 
hold on so dearly to our doctrine so much so that it defines who we are. But everything has its pros and cons. Everything has its lights and its shadows. And my how I found peace was to take the things that uplifted me, take the things that gave me positivity within myself, the things that resonated with me from not only those two factions, but everything that I encounter in life. You know what I mean? Not yeah, just absolutely. religion, but, you know, even the, the work that I do, you know, I work in corporate, I work in the arts, to be able to exist in the center point where I take from each experience the thing that uplifts me and makes me motivated to keep going. Otherwise, you constantly beat yourself up, mm -hmm. you know? It's like an inner turmoil of sorts. But yeah, that's how I kind of balance it. I, I take the good. I take the good and um, I acknowledge the things too that shake me up. Maybe it doesn't sit well with me. And I want to tell you that both things, if we were going to just talk about those two spiritual factions, they both have things that don't sit very well with me. So for example, Christianity and just the history of religion and, and what the Christian is like it's not it's not clean and it's not pretty to look at the history of what religion has done to our world and and the Rastafarian culture mm -hmm. is steeped in certain types of dogma mm -hmm. right thank you so much for that perspective I think it's really really beautiful um and and I like this this piece you know when we talk about taking these pieces that up, these pieces that uplift us I mean what came up for me when you were talking about that was like, I think there's a certain amount of trust that you need, you know, to be able to trust yourself, right? To to kind of, to be able to really um, separate, you know, yourself from the narratives that were told from the, from like you said, like being indoctrinated, right? Into certain uh, uh, mindsets. And so I think that, I think that's really powerful because to me, I kept thinking, I was like the amount of trust that you have to have in yourself to to know what's best for me and what empowers me and what inspires me and what uplifts me and what is actually propelling me forward. Yeah. And it, it just makes me think, you know, how, and it, it makes me think like, it's funny how it's, it's hard, right? How it like to have so much trust in ourselves to know what's best for ourselves is actually kind of hard because of the fact that we're always fed all these other narratives about who we're supposed to be and why. And so exactly. I really appreciated your reflection there because it was, it is a very um, inspiring and empowering reflection because it is this, at the end of the day, it comes down to how much do I trust myself to know that I know what's best for me, but also when I trust myself to know what's best for me and still things don't work out the way I envisioned or planned, I'm still yeah. trusting myself to know that I can figure it out or that I'm going to work through it. And all of that is like a very intimate relationship with yourself, right? Oh, totally. And the way that you said that too, I love that. Thank you for acknowledging that, that when things don't work out the way we expect it to, that always like smashes or <laughs> and blights all of our hopes and you're like oh well, I, well what do i know then you know what i mean but the body knows vanessa right yes the body knows it's embodied knowing and it's something mm. i'm growing into as i'm getting into spiritual practices like yoga and fasting and learning to listen to my body i lost 40 pounds in the past couple of months wow I, yeah, and it's healthy. I promise it's healthy. I've been going to the gym. I've been fasting. I've been drinking water. I've been sitting with myself. I've been trying to carve out quiet time for exactly that so I can sit with myself. So I can sit with myself. Because the body knows. And if we give it some time and listen to it, it will tell us. Absolutely. I'm so grateful that you went there because it's so true. And that is, that is trust, right? That trust, that inner knowing it's like, it's not the brain part that is the body. And it is, it is this, even, you know, when you're like these spiritual practices, that creating of space within, right. That opening up within, cause then you hear, you can hear what the body needs and wants. And, um, I, I absolutely love that so, so much. Can I share uh, with your listeners what happened about 15 minutes before our interview today? Of course, of course. I, guys, I've never been nominated for a Juno before. <laughs> so, <laughs> and a lot of things came up over the past couple of weeks about, okay, how do I show up in the, you know, 
myself in the best version of myself, but in the truest version of myself. Mm. And I started to reflect on, okay, what am I going to wear? How am I going to do my hair? And things like that. And so today, Sunday, one week before I have to go and show up on stage, this big platform is unprecedented in my career completely how do I show up and so earlier today I, I was like well I have this interview I'm super excited about it but my hair isn't done and I'm gonna show your no I'm gonna show your 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 listeners what I look like right hey now. there she is <laughs> Afro, my braider is coming but about an hour before the interview, I, I, I listened to my body and I felt nervous because I saw from the link that it was supposed to be audiovisual. And so, you know what? Juno nominees have makeup on and they're like, you know, they're stars and, you know, you know what I mean? And so I was like, okay, how do I approach this? And I was like, don't make yourself uncomfortable. Call Vanessa and tell her how you're feeling. And I'm like, Vanessa is, you know, remember I called you? You'd, I, oh, I, yes. And I was like, Vanessa, you know, I don't think I'm super camera ready. I don't want your, I don't want to disappoint you and just show up like this. And you, you think I'm unprepared when really I'm preparing so hard. <laughs> but this is just an example of like, you know, being, standing in my truth and mm. feeling feelings and being honest. About yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, and actually it was funny when you, when I got your message, I just finished meditating. And so then I saw your email and I was like, oh, I'll give her a call right now. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm so grateful. And like I said, I mean, I think you look magical, but for me, it's like, I'm, I'm never going to make anybody, you know, if you're not comfortable, you're not comfortable. And like you said, you got to be in your truth. Right. And, totally. and yeah. If you can't show this little clip, but um, bye guys. <laughs> That's funny. Well, thank you. No, I'm so happy we got to see you and just to prove that we are, in fact, talking to Jamila. Absolutely. Not the AI or anything. Not the AI version. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's really funny. No, thank you for sharing that. I think it's it's amazing and, and it's true, right? It really is about how can we be truthful to ourselves all the time and that's the most important thing. So thank you so much for that reminder. You're welcome. Um, I wanted to ask you, did you want to get into a little bit about um, balancing, you know, corporate world and being an artist? Because I think that's I think that's so wonderful because I think that a lot of people don't really realize um, artistry. You know, I myself, I'm also an author. And so I know that it's it's people, you know, people don't realize that, you know, there are these two worlds that do have to come together at a certain point. And so did you want to share a little bit more about that? I would love to. And uh, it made me so excited to hear that you too have this balance going, this balancing act of having a corporate life um, where you say you're in financing, right? And I am, yeah, you're in, yeah. And I am in IT. So I work with one, a very big IT company um, and I'm a project manager there. I've been working there for about three years because I reskilled when I came to Canada. That's mm -hmm. the experience of a lot of immigrants when you when they come to Canada specifically. You have to go back to school, and and I got a really good job. I'm really grateful for it. But the life of an independent artist, especially when you're on a growth trajectory similar to mine, it's like it starts to get big, like a like an avalanche. It's, it's growing, coming down, and it's getting bigger as as it's progressing, and and so the balancing act gets more sensitive it's like if you drop any of those balls you know mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot riding at stake so um that's something that i've had to um to figure out i love what the growth that i've had in my corporate world and at this point i am not ready to leave it not only because as an independent artist i'm not yet in a comfortable enough position to feel confident to do that from an economics standpoint but I'm still learning from corporate and especially the company that I'm with I'm gonna name them I work at IBM and I'm very grateful because they put a lot of emphasis on learning right on learning and I really love that I'm gonna give IBM several thumbs up for that I learn so much and it translates into my artistic life where I'm able to take on things in a different way, address issues, um, address complicated problems in ways that I learn through my project management practice. And it makes me an even better 
self-managed independent artist managing all the factors of production i know i do have a team i have a band of nine people i have a producer and i have also brought on to my team a personal assistant but even to be able to manage these people requires a certain level of um, a certain level of knowledge you know and so that's something that i i am really grateful for and maybe one day vanessa i'm able to be my own business and maybe i'll have to say bye to ibm but um it's not today <laughs> it's not today <laughs> No, thank you for sharing that. I think it's so important because I know that a lot of people and, and even artists, you know, a lot of artists don't really realize how important it is to have some of these foundational learnings that you can get from work experience. You know, um, I think a lot of creatives sometimes try to um, forget it, not forget, but, you know, just want to be creative that they don't try to balance that out with some of these other more uh, like tactical experiences that are really required in the artist field. And so I, I really appreciate that, um, you know, your gratitude for that experience and how it does help uh, not even like shape necessarily your cre your creative work, but it allows you to bring it out into the world, right? Because you do need those skills. And I've seen a lot of times with artists who want to depend on their management teams to do all of that stuff, but then they end up in positions later where, you know, they have to compromise a lot of things around their creativity and around their artistry just because uh, they don't want to take on those, those other challenges. Um, or, I mean, I don't even, I wouldn't even say they're challenges. Sometimes they're challenges to an artist because we want to be creative. <laughs> and so sometimes it's like, Oh, this is just getting in my way. Um, but there is a lot of value in being able to access that part of you as well as your creative part of you. Right. Absolutely. Um, I love the word, the use of the word compromise because i'll mm. tell you what the biggest compromise is you spend so much time on the bureaucracy of music business that the creativity suffers so yeah. i have a full-time job and i'm managing all i'm sending all the emails me and jenny my personal assistant it's just us and our computer around the dining table and we're taking on the days and it's all great but when do i write the music you see mm. I am. I have an album coming out. It was supposed to be end of spring, but sorry, guys, it's probably going to be early summer. <laughs> you know, we got a Juno nomination. We had to put some things on. Blog. But I'll I'll tell you what I noticed. I was creating to meet deadlines because right. you know there's not a lot of studios available, and I'm, I'm I'm my production is at a level where there's a certain level of production that I'm holding myself to, and you know it's like. So I'm creating to meet the studio time that I might not get because they're booked out till next month. There's just like all these things you have to think about. That's just an example. But it's like I am not finding a lot of time to create. And inspiration is a fickle thing. Sometimes <laughs> you have to sit quietly and allow it to come, come to you. It's, it, it's not always for me personally easy to just sit down and be like okay i have to push out five songs in four weeks and i find myself especially with the production of this album i found myself in that position and i had to cycle back to the jamila of 10 years ago and and resurrect some songs that i wrote when i had this thing i'm living this experience there is an opportunity to make it better i don't know how yet vanessa but the independent artist need some support where they are able to manage the factors of their business but also leave time for creativity and not for forced creativity right the, art, the artist must sit in silence vanessa they must sit in silence and i haven't been giving myself that grace i don't have the time and so I'm, I'm still working through that. So if any of your audience members listen to this podcast and have ideas, you know, shoot me a message. It's something that I'm thinking about because there's an opportunity here. How do we streamline things for the independent artists so that they can still honor themselves? I, I laud every person who says, I'm not going to sign to a label. I'm going to keep my thing the way I want to keep it. But I also want them to have the time. Yeah. Because you will send emails from now till next week and not write a single song 
or not sing, not hum a melody, and then you have the audacity to go out there and say you're a singer. When you know I'm an email sender is what I am. You know what I mean? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> totally. <laughs> But you know, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah. The artist needs some quiet time. <clears throat> I totally hear you. And, you know, it, it's kind of funny when I think of myself, like you said, I'm, I'm also, I'm in investing. And so, you know, it's the same idea. But what I've, what I've noticed for myself is I don't try to kind of separate these two versions of me anymore. I just sort of allow them to blend together in both settings in the way that you know, these versions of me just choose to present themselves. I really have taken off a lot of almost pressure off myself and being like, oh, like I have to be this person in corporate versus this person as an artist. And it's like, I've really learned. I'm like, actually, no, I don't. I can still be an artist in my corporate life and I can still bring my corporate life into my artistry. And I think that to me is where balance comes in. Right. And I think it's like, if you, you know, I'm a very spiritual person. And so I'm always talking about like your feminine and masculine energies, right? Yeah. Um, it's about balancing them both. And sometimes I think, you know, because we live in this like 3D experience, you know, this 3D world, and yeah. we have other human beings around us all the time that, you know, I feel, I feel that my human experience is like, if I were to look at it as a scale, and I'm like, you know, here's one end is your feminine energy, and the other end is your masculine. But I try to, you know, when I'm balanced, I'm kind of right in the middle, but then there are certain circumstances, I have to, you know, shift a little bit more into my masculine energy, but then I try to come back to that balance again, or shift a little bit more into my feminine energy, and then try to come back to that balance, right. And so when I like, think of it from the scale, it helps me kind of operate and flow almost, maybe not operate, but I would say flow between these two states. And then I realize like there are many times in my, in my like corporate setting and in my finance world where I can bring in my creative energy in so many different ways. Um, you know, whether it's like problem solving, I mean, we don't, we really underestimate how much creativity actually can fuel things like problem solving. Um, I'm also like one of those very mindful people in the workplace, like I'm very mindful of how I communicate, when I communicate, you know, a lot of times we like to, you know, you like to be, like you said, professional email senders. We think so we got to email everything. And I actually don't email very many people a day because I take my time before I actually get into my work. I'm like, okay, what do I actually have to do here today? Do I actually need to communicate this to this person? No, I have a meeting with them tomorrow. I can bring it up then. Like, you know, I think it's things like that. Right. But, but that's been, that's been my learnings over the last, I would say year. And I would say for sure in the last six months, I feel like I've really been balancing these, these versions of me. Like I would consider my creative self, you know, an analogy would be the feminine energy. And then my corporate self is the more masculine energy. But yeah. like when I, again, like when I kind of, they can blend together and I can be both of these people in either of these settings. And sometimes they just kind of flow back and forth, but I've really been settling into that. That's beautiful. And the way that you use the analogy of the masculine and feminine mm. energies, I resonate with that a lot. Um, and the dance that you do to be able to maintain some semblance of equilibrium, right? Yeah, that's beautiful. I'm gonna I'm gonna adopt that if that's okay with you. Of course. <laughs> but I do have a question for you. It's yes. like, when do you all download your artistic creation? Because, you know, so for example, you've mentioned you're an author. You have to create space for that. And right. I'm interested in hearing because I love the way I love the way you approach it. I'm interested to see if like, do you create that time? Do you schedule it? Like, mm. Inspiration doesn't tell you when it's. Yes, coming. I know. <laughs> doesn't. I that know. That? Yes, I know. No. That's the part. Go ahead. That's the hard part. That is the hard part. Um, but I think that in in many cases, I tend to prioritize the inspiration. So for example, um, I'm fairly, like I'm, I'm regimented, but in a way that is flexible, right? Like I'm regimented in a way that I don't put pressure on myself. It's like, oh, I have to like journal today and I have to do this, right? It's kind of like, okay, you know, I try to say, I know that I'm most t tend to be most creative in the mornings and most and in the evenings, usually like before bed, especially after a shower or something, mm -hmm. then I'm, I, it just puts me in this very like flow state. And so if I need to create something, you know, that those are the spaces for me or the yeah. times for me to really reconnect with myself. So it's either in the morning, usually after when I walk my dog, um, you know, and, and I, you know, I wake up, I do yoga and then I'll meditate, take the dog out, kind of also come back and usually meditate again and then journal. And it's like somewhere in that point, 
I'll kind of sit back and just kind of hold space with myself. And I'm like, well, you know, is there anything creative that I want to do or that that just needs to come out right now? Yeah. And then same thing at nighttime after a shower and I'm like in my bathrobe. I'm like, all right, is there any creativity here that needs an outlet? And so when I think of me and, and, and my creative process, I think that I, I kind of like, I don't plan a lot of my creativity. If I'm writing, if I'm going to, if I'm writing a book, like, it's not like I sit down, I'm like, I'm going to write a book. It's that, like, I allow my writings to come together in a way where I'm like, Hey, I think these pieces can come together to create something. And so it's like the intention, I kind of build with that intention, you know, like I evolve with the intention. And I think that allows me to stay truthful as well to my inspiration, to the messages I want to get out. Cause I'm not like forcing myself that I have to like get this done. Right. It's just like, well, there will be, I will keep writing and it'll keep evolving. And eventually I'll see what I want to create with this, if that makes sense. Um, but, but I think for me, like, you know, I, I think I prioritize more, the giving myself space to be creative as opposed to here's my space to actually create the tangible thing. Does that make sense? Because I think the tangible things come out of just the process itself. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> you you just dropped so many gems, man. Like can we do another podcast tomorrow? Yeah. Because I'm into it. All right. You said um holding space for yourself. Mm. And you also said evolving with your intentions mm. yeah exactly yeah <laughs> it brings me to a con like a, a practice so as i said I've, I've been really sitting with my body and and, mm -hmm. and just like going through this big change over the past year i promise and a big powerful practice is i don't have a dog i have a cat so i don't walk her but i nice. walk myself no i walk myself nice mm. before 9 a.m when i let the world in Mm. I go for a walk. It doesn't matter what the weather is outside. And I go for a walk. And going out, I don't have my headphones going out. Mm. So um, when coming back in, from where, like, when, you, when I start the, the trajectory back to my apartment, I have headphones and I'll either listen to a podcast or work on a tune I've been, you know, toying with. But yeah. going out, the first... 30 minutes or so of my walk, which it averages around 45 minutes to an hour every morning. Wow. Uh, I try to get 10,000 steps just to give myself some like, like a goal, you know? So the first 30 minutes of that walk usually is just me and my thoughts. Mm. The things from yesterday that are still like sitting heavy on me. It's that it's in that time when I take that walk that I let that off. Cause otherwise I bring it into the next day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I have to be honest, when you when you said that just now, um, about like sitting sitting with your evolving with your intention, this is the time of the day that allows my brain to just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. gives my it's like a fresh it's like almost as if you open my brain and just blew blow a nice little breath in there like Yeah, 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 yeah. I actually understand that feeling. I actually know what you're describing. Yes. <laughs> and it's kinda of weird, but that's what it feels like in the morning. And so I give thanks for these practices and how they've really helped to, to balance me and stabilize me. Yeah. No, I think that's really beautiful. Um, that's, that's really beautiful. And, and, and like, I think, and I think it, it's like that allowing, right? Because when all these spiritual practices is just this practice of creating space right within. And so the more space that you have, the more that you will just create very organically. And so, you know, that's why I kind of prioritize more the spaces for that creativity to flow because I know the tangible thing of that creativeness will present itself. You know what I mean? And so, and then I think, and then I think also just kind of removing the time restraints as best as you can. Right. It, like, I mean, I think, like you said, when you're kind of juggling things like studio time, that's very different. And so you kind of have to do your best, but it's almost like if there's a way to, because I think that the time restraint, the time restraints create that like physical blockage in the body, right? So it's more like, okay, these time restraints are still here, but like they just can't take up space in the body because that's going to impede the creative flow. You know what I mean? So it's it's like it's that's like also that that other part of balancing, right? It's like okay, there's still that time restraint, that's fine, but that's just got to not take up space here. And and for myself and my journey that's been a lot of my dialogue recently has been even when I'm journaling, like my prompts or what I like typically tend to, to go towards are like, well, 
what what's taking up space right now and how can I create space and how can I hold space with whatever is coming up right now? You know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, that's been my, my, I've noticed that that's been my inner dialogue for the last little bit. It's always so refreshing to talk to, um, my artist peers, regardless of what the discipline is. And just to, to feel like, you know, you're not alone. We're all having these experiencing, these experiences and learning and growing and figuring it out. You know what I mean? And so I wasn't quite sure where our discussion would go, but oh boy, am I glad (laughs) that we got here. You know, it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing with me and for, um, for allowing me to share as well. I appreciate it so much. Of course. Thank you. And just before we, we sign off, I wanted to, what do you have going on this week before the Junos next week? Okay, so my braider is coming this afternoon. <laughs> but um, oh no, I'm so excited! My mom and sister are gonna be coming to the award show with me. We have some rehearsals with the band because you know we're playing the actual opening night awards. Ah, yes. what? <laughs> what? Oh, that's amazing. And we're bringing some some parts of our community together because you know I'm in Mi'kmaq, um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, the unceded land of the Mi'kmaq um, Indigenous people, and so I have two Mi'kmaq artists that will be joining my presentation. And I'm so wow. grateful they've shared with me so much, um, especially Tristan Wolfcastle, a rapper from um, New Brunswick, and that's like really i'm learning so much i'm I'm not from here i'm from the caribbean and so the indigenous people of jamaica would have been the arawaks and the titles and so to, 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 wow. just so we all understand that the issue of colonization has changed our world in so many ways and for us to all be able to acknowledge the first people and and, and acknowledge that their land is where we are living now and to create beautiful art and to be able to honor it in this way i'm really really excited and so um excited to play east coast family to open the night with tristan wolf castle morgan tony wendy mckaisa owen o sound lee and my entire band we're so excited so rehearsals getting <laughs> around the city um during the time and so I'm playing one on Friday night with my band. So that's going to be a longer show versus the one song we'll open the Junos with. And so this is all exciting for me. I'm excited. And then Sunday, I fly to Jamaica. What? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. That, that sounds amazing. That sounds absolutely amazing. And I, I was actually, I'm, I'm really glad because I'm glad you're going to go to Jamaica because I was thinking, I was like, is she going to go do the Junos and then have to go to the office the next day? Oh no! I, I so, wow, great question. That would have been the case if I did not see the sign from far away and spoke with my boss and told them that I needed some time. Yeah, and they were really they're they're all so excited. Yeah, my my team internally at my office are gonna wear their IBM shirts, and I think they're gonna come to my show. Oh, that's so nice. Time. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. No, I love that. Well, congratulations. And also, I want to say thank you for that shout out around um, like the impacts of colonization um, and, and honoring our, our lands. I really want to thank you for that because um, I also think it's very important. I'm in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, very up north. And, um, you know, we, um, um, I think like I'm, I grew up in a city where we're actually um, like amongst multiple reserves and, and my local university actually used to be a residential school. And it's, it's, it's crazy, you know, growing up in this hometown, but how much of that was hidden for me. And I was actually just talking to, I did an interview last week with an indigenous woman who uh, runs Moontime Connections, which is around um, access to femme products, femme care products for women in remote communities and, and indigenous communities. And so we were actually speaking about this, but I'm, I'm just, I think it's very important. So I'm really grateful that you, that you also brought that up. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, man. I continue to learn about it. I am an immigrant and I'm continuing to learn about this land that I've come to love and to be able to honor it in any way I can. And so yeah, it's so important for us to hold space for mm. our community members their lot absolutely thank you so much for coming on the show jamila um i honestly i'm not gonna lie i usually don't watch the junos but you know what just for you i might i might watch it i might watch i'm gonna tune in just so that i get to see you because i'm, I'm very excited about it thank you so much Vanessa. it's my pleasure let's keep in touch and um yeah let's let's hold space again i really love this today yeah <laughs> yeah that sounds fantastic thank you so much